I will explore some of the hottest business and economic topics. The thing is, at least it's in the Philippines, because there's always going to be a conflict at some point between commercial considerations and social considerations. Well, how does the crop insurance extend to the credit as well? Whenever a bank lends to either rice or corn, by law, that loan must be covered by crop insurance. Good evening. Welcome to Eye on Business. I'm Ben Kritz. Well, here in the Philippines, we are fortunate to have what is generally regarded as one of the better performing stock markets in Asia and occasionally the entire world. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Philippine Stock Exchange has actually won awards for being the best stock exchange uh, in 2013, 2015, and 2016. The Alpha Southeast Asia Deal Awards chose the PSE as the best stock exchange in Asia or the whole world? In, in Asia. Okay, in Asia. in Asia. All right. But for most people, unless you are actually an investor in the stock market or involved in it in some fashion, for most people, the stock exchange is kind of a mystery. And that's aggravated to some extent here because the number of investors in our local stock market is actually quite small relative to the size of the population and the size of the economy. Now, I think most people have a vague understanding that the performance of the stock market corresponds to some degree to the wider economy. In other words, when the stock market is high or it is going up, things are generally pretty good, and when the stock market is declining, and maybe economic conditions are not so good. But beyond that, um, people don't really understand it, and, and like I said, unless they are actually involved in it. And of course, lately, we've had a string of unusual events uh, the entire month of January and the beginning of this month. Um, Surprises such as the Taal Volcano uh, towards the beginning of last month, the coronavirus outbreak or epidemic or pandemic or however, whatever they're calling it now. Um, stock markets react to that kind of thing and they react to other things too like shifts in oil prices, uh, geopolitical tensions, uh, rumors of trade deals, actual trade deals etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, stock markets tend to be very sensitive to those kind of things and the Philippine Stock Exchange Index the PSEI which is the stock market that you hear about in the news every day has been no exception to the sensitivity going around the world and you can correct me if I'm wrong but I believe the month of January it ended up almost 8% lower than it did at the beginning of the month 7.86% uh, actually uh, which was the biggest drop since November 2016 and as we all know the disaster that happened that month was the election of President Donald Trump um, so that, that kind of uh, puts uh, bookends on the stock market opinion about world events. Even so, the PSEI is held up relatively better than a lot of other markets, uh, especially around Asia, particularly in China, although it's pretty understandable why China is having problems right now. And the reason uh, the PSEI has managed to stay relatively stable, at least a big part of the reason, is that the PSE has remarkably sound management. Part of that management is here with me this evening, uh, joining me tonight to discuss some of the latest developments involving the stock market and to share a few insights about the inner workings of the PSE is Attorney Royal Refran. Now, you're the Chief Operating Officer and Executive Vice President of the PSE, correct? Thank you, yes. And uh, in addition to that, you're also the Vice Chair of the Philippines National Market Practice Group and Chairman of the Capital Markets Development Committee of the Philippine Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Thank you for coming in and uh, joining me tonight. And Let's talk about the stock market. Um, 
How are we doing right now? Uh, I've noticed that in the past couple of days, it seems to have picked back up after the, um, the little dip, mostly because of the coronavirus. Uh, is that a pretty fair assessment? Or are people getting accustomed to the fact that there's an epidemic going on and now that's priced into the market? Um, or are they just picking up the pieces from the fire sale the last uh, week or so? So you actually hit the uh, right notes at the start when you said the sensitivity of the markets is, uh, cannot be overemphasized. So mm -hmm. you look at January and uh, what well, a month that was, right? Uh, mm -hmm. um, we survived it. I, you are correct. We were down 8%. But right now, year to date, we're just um, roughly around 3.8%, 3.9% from the opening for this year. Right. Our index is at that level. So um, what we're seeing, however, is the flight to safety of uh, maybe more of the foreign as well. You know, when there's uncertainty, obviously you will look to safe haven assets and probably reallocate your portfolio. And that's what we're seeing mm -hmm. um, as of late. Um, participation, for example. So when you look at the foreign versus the local participation, for the longest time, it was roughly 49, 50%. Right. So it's an even split. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, right now, we're seeing more of the 57%. So it's, it's picked up. Uh, in terms of participation, which means actually on a net basis, they're actually sellers, net foreign selling right now. Mm -hmm. As we speak, it's roughly around $7 billion. It was higher, of course, the previous uh, weeks. But what, what's that telling us is that there's a lot of opportunities also, as you mentioned, for investors to probably pick up a few good stocks that they feel um, on a medium or long-term basis could be better suited in their portfolio. Right. So we always highlight that aspect of suitability, right? If your investment horizon is medium or long-term, then that would differ very much from an investor, a retail, who's looking at it from a 12-month period or maybe even a little over that. Mm -hmm. Because not all stocks are created equal. Man. Some mm -hmm. are regularly paying dividends. So that bodes well for investors who are actually in it for the regular income stream. And later, we'll probably talk about a new asset class that we have just recently, I would always say, uh, it was a baby that was recently born after mm -hmm. 11 years. No? Right. So that, that's the mentality right now. People could be bargain hunting. And that's why we've seen for the past two days, market immediately picked up at seven, to 7,500 levels. Can you imagine? Right. In less than two days, we gained you, easily 200, 300 points. Uh, so you clawed back about half of the half of the January drop exactly. in the last couple of days. Correct. That's correct. I think it was up uh, more than 2% yesterday. Correct. correct. Um, well, here's something that I think uh, I wonder about. Well, I kind of know the answer to this, but, but it, if, you look at, if you look at the way the stock market reacts. Now, if people understand stocks, they understand that they're buying a piece of a company and their, their decision to buy or sell that stock should be based on what their company's doing, its financial health, does it pay dividends, is it growing, is it shrinking? However, why does the market react the way it does to news that would not necessarily seem to have anything to do with the companies that people are invested in? For instance, you know, the coronavirus. Um, it's going to take a long time for any effects of the coronavirus to affect a company that says, say, makes cars or um, has cell phone services. Right. Right. You know, so why, why, explain to people why, do, why is the market so sensitive? Right. Um, well, what, what is going on there? Right. So there are macro risks, there are market risks, as mm -hmm. we call it. And on the other hand, there are company-specific risks, right? Which right. could be, um, so there's those two clusters. One actually affects the general e economy and necessarily as well, the players in that economy, right? Mm -hmm. If it's uh, investment grade rating issues, if it's, uh, let's say, a virus that could impact trade relations in terms of our dependence with, let's say, a very strong trading partner, as well as tourism and all that. So that pretty much affects the mood and the sentiment across all industries, asset classes, right? So that's the, the reason why you would see negative information or adverse information that would, um, in general, impact 
the economy would also not be favorable to the market. Although you, you look at the size of our market versus the GDP, we're pretty much mirroring on a one is to one, although slightly less right nowadays. Our mm -hmm. market's right now 16 trillion pesos. GDP is almost 18 trillion. Right. Right? So used to be a much, uh, uh, I would say, mirror image. But that being said, the company-specific news, on the other hand, as, as, as we would uh, have to make a decision on the basis of disclosure submitted to the PSE mm -hmm. and, and disseminated through our um, portal, which is an electronic disclosure portal, that should actually be also a very relevant material information for investors mm -hmm. who actually want to either maybe hold on to their stocks or maybe in, in, increase their holdings or even divest their holdings. So right. the simple reason is the efficiency principle of markets will still have to be a given. Markets mm -hmm. are deemed or are expected to factor in all relevant information right. on a macro level and on a micro level. Therefore, there's really no single risk that can be that can have a one is to one correlation as to the movement of stock prices. And so, but in general, of course, there's different views and opinions on the impact of, let's say, um, regulatory risks materializing in the case of some of our companies and regulatory risk borne by political risk that somehow impacts the longevity that could impact the franchise, for example, um, of special companies which actually require um, um, franchises from either Congress or really licenses, right? So right. those are another set of risks, mm -hmm. regulatory risks, but those are company specific. Right. On the other hand, yeah, you I know, think people would understand, uh, you know, I, I was trying to avoid naming certain companies, right. but we've had the water companies, right. for instance, and right. they have been in hot water, so to speak, um, you know, in the past couple of months. And so I think that, that makes sense to people. Okay. Right their stock is going to be affected by the news there. Um, the broadcasting company, there's been some news there, so that stock's going to be right. affected. And that, that makes sense, but, um, you know, it's the, it's the macro okay. risk that... Right. And, and, and in, in the past, how I've tried to explain it to people and, and in my column is it, it, the stock market kind of serves as a canary in a coal mine for the entire okay. economy. Um, you know, it doesn't right. really... It's not going to affect the economy, and the economy is just, it's just a signal of things that are going on. Right. We can talk a little bit more about that maybe after a break. Okay, and we're back. All right, I just want to ask one more question about what we were talking about before the break. How do you think the ordinary public, people who aren't investors in the stock market but are interested in what's going on because they want to stay on top of the news, how should they regard the news? What, what, how, what conclusions should they draw from the market moving up and down every day? Um, you know, it takes a it takes a dip of like two or three percent because there's a bad news day. Right. You know what 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 do you want people to understand about what's going on in the right. market? So, I I think that really reflects the DNA of any market that volatility mm -hmm. will always be expected, and that's expected because any given day there are market moving news, not necessarily in the Philippines, in the region, in Asia, but also around the world. Right. So. Um, the, the, the reaction that, sh uh, that is um, elicited should also be a function of the investor's appetite for risk, right? Mm -hmm. In general, if I am into investing, I would probably be more, uh, more of a risk taker if I have a substantial size of my portfolio in equity investment. Equity meaning you are a shareholder of publicly listed companies. So your appetite for risk is more than the usual because otherwise mm -hmm. you would probably go to the treasuries to the uh, corporate bonds because mm -hmm. that's pretty stable right you get your coupon i get right. my principal back after one two years but here that's that's fair game for equity stockholders mm -hmm. and um the volatilities if you can write that out because really 
you understand what's the medium term um, prospects for that company, the cash flows, for example, right? You may be into looking at opportunities where you see the dividend yield, which is really a function of the stock, um, the function rather of the cash dividends as, as really in relation to the stock price. If you're having, let's say, a company paying 2 3% dividend yield, right? You don't mind also the volatility in the interim because you're also not liquidating. You may have a negative uh, mark-to-market loss, as we call it. So as you're not realizing that loss, you're, you're probably in good stead. And some actually even buy more to bring down their average purchase price for a particular stock, right? So when you see all those news and you're not yet invested in the market, I probably would always say, um, if you have dry powder, if you have cash that you're not going to use for in the short term for right. urgent requirements, no, then you may have to consider if there are opportunities that you're missing out, right? You're, are you leaving money on the table? Because right now we have made investing simpler, mm-hmm. whether it be for initial public offering companies or when you want to go into already listed companies. What do I mean by simpler? There are now technologies in place so that from account opening all the way to trading, all the way to your monitoring your accounts, you could actually use technology. And you know, Filipinos, probably the ratio of smartphones to the population is what? More than? Uh, Slightly over one. More than one, right? So (laughs) we, we, we are actually the perfect um, context for a technology-enabled market, mm-hmm. and for example, uh, um, let us let, let's take for example a very recent project that we launched for companies that will, for the first time, offer their shares to the public, and this is what you call an initial public offering or right. IPOs. Right. For the longest time, we have what we call the local small investor program. What it is is out of the total universe, total amount that the company wants to raise from the public via an IPO, 10% is set aside for what we consider to be the local small investors. Mm -hmm. You are considered a local small if you're investing no more than 100,000 pesos. Right. right? So before, without the technology, they would have to line up during their lunch break. Hopefully, they catch the, um, the, the receiving center after office, but normally during lunch break, that's very tedious, man. You come mm-hmm. back because you haven't yet submitted all the forms. Mm-hmm. We have done away with that because we have now launched what we call an electronic allocation system where all you have to do is open an account with your broker and then log into our system. And there you go. You could already subscribe to any IPO for purposes of the local small investor program. Would you believe that was a very simple innovation? Of course, we had to um, come up with the system and make sure it's robust. Participation on the local small small investor for the longest time has always just been 1% out of the 10%. Because people really found it so time consuming. And offerings are five days normally. So in five days, can you imagine? I have to squeeze in Mm -hmm. and go to the malls, go to the centers. Guess now the participation, 9.5%, 9.7%. I long for the day when it's fully taken up. Well, that's been, a, that, that's been part of the reason why your mark, why there's been such a small population of investors is because it's been so difficult. I've heard yes. this comment in years past from other yes. people that, that, you know, and you're working on it, making it easier. So, yes. that's, so that's good news. Since you brought up the subject to IPOs, um, what, how, what, are we, what are we expecting this year? Do you have a... Um, do, do you have a sense of how many uh, might be seeing oh, wow. through the year? At, at the start of the year, we were, like last year, we were targeting six to eight mm-hmm. companies. Now, uh, start of the year, we had a very positive development with uh, the framework for real estate investment trust mm-hmm. finally being uh, set in motion. And they say framework that goes for the tax framework, that goes yeah. for the uh, securities registration framework. And the third um, leg of that equation is the listing framework, right? So I think this year will be a very, very uh, opportune time for idle, for real estate companies to reconsider their structures for purposes of availing of incentives under the REIT, which is a really a re- real estate investment trust framework. And hopefully we get to see 
couple of the good brands do an REIT listing IPO for this year, right? Not to mention uh, the pipeline for uh, companies that plan five, three years ahead. Mm -hmm. And hopefully they do decide to take the risk. Because really, when you decide to do an IPO, you're also faced with a lot of uncertainties and realize that as in when you finally set your price, a lot of things could be happening. And January was no exception, right? We saw that um, all of these can really impact your valuation as a company. Yeah. Right? So um, we're looking forward to hopefully getting that six six companies at the, on a conservative basis listed. Okay. We have 268 right now. Right. Um, there was a year back in 2013 when we had eight companies that actually decided to go public. Mm -hmm. Right. Of course, we're open for business. Um, what we do right now is we are also making sure the rules are as pro-business as they can be. The ease of doing business, right? Sometimes mm -hmm. um, that has to be given priority because the cycle, uh, you do not expect the cycle to produce a different result if the inputs and the framework are not also reinforced. Right. right? So. Well, let's, let's talk about the rights. The REIT, Real Estate Investment Trust. And I think we both agree that that's probably the biggest, the biggest thing that's happened in the, uh, in the last couple of months or weeks, and it's been a long time gone. Um, to explain to people what, what an REIT is, what we'll call, we'll call it a right. That's how I would pronounce right. it. I don't know how it, that, that's Some people right. call it rights, rights, yes. It, well, looks like, I worked in Germany, it looks like a uh, okay. right. Um, <laughs> but uh, explain what a real estate investment trust is okay. and, and um, you know, what, uh, what companies can do with it, what investors Correct. can do with it. Correct. So uh, um, I'd first take the perspective of an issuer or a company or a corporation, right? What is an REIT to the issuer, right? And why would it even uh, endeavor to uh, restructure its uh, assets into and create a vehicle for an REIT or a real estate investment trust? And then later on, for the second um, uh, perspective, that will be the perspective of an investor. Right? So um, a corporation that actually has income-producing real estate can actually house that income-producing real estate in an ordinary corporation. And that being said, it will be subject to the regular corporate income tax. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really not, nothing fancy about it. It's just like any other company, right? So what's an REIT? An REIT, the way Republic Act 9856 was um, formulated, finalized in Congress, this was 11 years ago, is actually a special purpose vehicle. And it's sole purpose is actually to hold title or legal ownership over that income-producing real property, right? This, 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 to simplify, it can be really an airport, it can be a mall, because these are real properties that have regular income stream. Mm -hmm. It could be a warehouse, it could be a tall road, you know, it could be a retirement village, hospitals, perfect examples, and all that, right? Shopping malls, as I mentioned. So that company would then consider the pros and the cons of carving out that income-producing asset and placing it under an REIT structure, which is actually, on a structure uh, consideration, a corporation, mm -hmm. right? It's no different from your other corporation, but it has legal obligations under the law. And what are those legal obligations that the issuers or the sponsors would have to comply with? Any given year, the most important, every, any given year, out of my distributable income, you are mandated by law to distribute to your shareholders no less than 90% mm -hmm. of your distributable income, right? And this is not by generosity of the board, because normally dividends are subject to the consideration and decision right. of the board of directors. Right? You may have income, but the board might say, let's appropriate that because we have a capex spend, capital expenditure, mm -hmm. I need to build up, right? You may have income, but decide to defer declaration. For ordinary corporations, that's the case. But for an REIT, 
for you to avail of certain fiscal incentives, you have to comply with the mandatory dividend distribution requirement, which is distribute 90%. Some REITs distribute 100% of right. their distributable income, right? It flows to the sponsors. And because they are also, second requirement is for them to become listed. Now, the public shareholders will also receive that benefit, right? Because normally that would be one third share to the public. 33% of the shares will have to be divested by the sponsors, principals given to the public. That's the IPO process. Mm -hmm. And in exchange, what do they get by way of tax incentives? The amount of dividends that they distribute will now be considered as deductible expense for purposes of corporate taxation. Oh, that's, a, that's a good one. Okay, let's take another short break. Mga isyung pinag-uusapan Mga palitang laman ng pahayagan Impormasyong dapat niyong malaman Tatalakayin, pupusisiin At hihimayin ni Mario Garcia Kasama ang kanyang mga panauhin sa harap ng bayan Face Off! Talking about the Real Estate Investment Trust, our right, R E I T, and I'll tell you something, um, and I'm I'm sure Raul's going to agree with me, but if you're not an investor in the financial markets right now, and you have some money sitting around that you want to do something with, this is really something you ought to think about. Um, there are big benefits for investors, and there's big benefits for companies too, and it. Explain, we, we talked about this a little bit before the break, but the big benefit for the company, as I understand it, is that it's a huge tax break. Yes. You know, so by putting together a right, yes. and, and which spreads the benefits from that out to the, the shareholders, a third of whom are public, yes. the company is rewarded by a huge tax break yes. on their corporate taxes. Yes. And then what's the benefits for the investors? Okay. The investors, because this is required to be publicly listed, the investors who subscribe and buy the shares in an IPO or even after the IPO will receive the dividends that are mandated to be declared out of distributable income by the company. So, what is it? It's really a yields instrument. When mm -hmm. I say yields, returns. Right. If you consider other alternatives out there, there would be bond instruments, fixed income instruments, right? Regularly um, distributing the coupon or the interest payments mm -hmm. to whoever is the holder of those corporate or government bonds. A REIT, actually, when investors look at it, they also are incentivized because of the yields. Right. And that will always be a function of the quality of your tenants. For example, if you're looking at a, a mall, um, the, 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 the quality of the asset itself as a function of the income that flows into the asset, right? For mm -hmm. example, how exposed or how sensitive are the tenants to the economic situation to the point that if the economy turns bad, do they suddenly pre-terminate? Or are they still there because they're into consumption? Are they still there because this is a, an infrastructure where, like it or not, you will use the facilities. Could be an airport, could be a road. Right. Other, other REITs in Singapore um, right now are into data centers, right? Telecommunication right. towers, I have, I have, hospitals. I've heard, I've heard of that. Um, the, the, cell, the cell towers. Cell towers, right. Yeah. So um, the, way, the way REITs have evolved in other markets, Singapore, Australia, Japan, U.S., are probably in the fourth, third iteration. We are still in version 1.0. Huge benefits to the economy because um, as agreed with the Department of Finance, whatever the sponsors raise when they sell their stake, because they will have to divest so that the public has that one third, right? right. And that's the sponsors selling their stake because normally they would have 100%. So that 30% will come back to the sponsors by way of the proceeds because the public will buy those shares. Right. The sponsors are required to reinvest. And Secretary Domingos was very clear reinvest in, in the domestic economy. So you also have that multiplier effect. Even without that reinvestment, you already have the expected multiplier effect. And it's not because of guesstimates. 
but it's empirical evidence that we have seen in other markets. Right. And well, they swear it's by been, it. It's yeah, it's more been jobs. Uh, it's been a normal thing for years in other markets, and so you should have a body of data yes. of what the what the effects are. You know, yes. that's something for for the economists to right. figure out. But the, the information is there. It has taken so long to put this together here yes. because it's only been recently that they've changed the rules. So. Yes. So okay, let me let me play devil's advocate a little bit here. I'm a, I'm a sm, I'm a small investor. You know, I have a little, I have a I have some government bonds. I'm getting about say, about three percent on those. Those are state that's guaranteed. Uh, put that money in the bank already. You know, just when it when it comes due, I'm gonna I'm gonna get my three percent return. I know I can count on it, and I'm comfortable with that. So why would I want to take the risk on Something like a, what's what what is better about a right than very good, than very good question. Like a bond. Okay, so um, for any bond instrument, right, there will always be terms and clauses which could actually shorten your cash flows because there are what we call the redemption options on the part of the issuer. What it is is um, defined periods, normally third or fifth anniversary year. The company will say, let me think about the interest rate environment. And if I feel I'm better off buying out your holdings to refinance because the interest rates have gone low and I'm paying you high interest rates, then that option is for me to exercise. Right? Right. Technically, they will redeem. So if you're the investor of the bond, you're actually looking at that horizon prior to redemption because most probably that will be exercised when interest rates actually go down compared to the time when it was issued. So you're looking at three, five years. Yeah, which, you just, to, which you just did yesterday, I think. Uh, correct. They, they cut the rates again. Correct, right. Yeah. But on your end, because you're a client of that, that um, corporation, most probably for their, they will reissue new bonds because they need to refinance. Mm -hmm. You'll get another one, but this time lower coupon. Right. Rate. Okay. That's a bonds. Okay, that's fair game. You're conservative investors. You don't like the volatilities in the market. You don't really understand the nuances. This one, a bond, is pretty straightforward. But what we're saying, for your investors who would like to diversify and have a portion of their portfolio invested in equities, as you mentioned, this, is, this could probably present the, both, the best of both worlds. You have the yields as well as you have the potential appreciation in the stock price. Well, normally, REITs, the stock price, would not normally be very much uh, a source of capital gains. Except when, for example, they acquire new assets, mm -hmm. they sell assets to replace it with another asset and all that, right? Because as we, as we mentioned at the start, it's the yields on the REITs because of the required 90% at right. the very minimum to be distributed. You get that every year. So these year are, year these, are, these are income producing assets, yes. as you said, a mall, uh, something that generates some kind of income yes. so that if they can make that income yes. increase, so the rents increase in the mall, yes. the traffic increases in the mall, yes. the revenue of the mall goes up, your return is going to increase yes. in, your, in your, your right. Yes. So in other markets, uh, they looked at it as a pass-through entity. The income passes through the vehicle for distribution to the shareholders, right? Mm -hmm. And... While technically this is not the case in the Philippines, it actually works that way as well because um, the REIT still gets taxed, right? It's, uh, if, if it were a pass-through, your idea there would be not to tax the REIT, the REIT, right. and just to tax the shareholders as and when they receive the dividend income. Right. In our market, it's actually hybrid, and this we adopted from other markets. No? Mm -hmm. There's still corporate tax on the REIT, except that it can avail of additional dividends deduction for purposes of computing the base for income tax purposes. Ordinarily, for a regular corporation, that can't be done. You right. cannot deduct <clears throat> dividends declared and use that as an offset to your income so that mm -hmm. you pay the government less because right. I claim deduction for... No, nice try. here, yeah. REITs, you have that embedded in the law. So you see, that benefit in yours to the benefit, that, that advantage in yours to the benefit of the issuer, REIT companies, mm -hmm. no? We have the big names here in the in the Philippines. You probably would have that um, in your in your uh, in your mind. So that they take advantage of because they're able to also unlock the value. Otherwise, right now it's immersed. It's 
it's uh, bundled with other assets, right? Normally, you have the holding company and you have the operating right. subsidiaries underneath. The moment you carve that out, you're creating a new fundraising portal for the company. Again, if I'm an investor, I should be very, very excited because as we've seen through financial crisis, REITs are pretty pretty much able to withstand right. yeah, financial crisis. No? Whether it be 07 crisis. The particularly other, when it's on an institutional kind of kind of asset. Yes. You know? I mean, yes. maybe a mall would be a little bit risky in an right. economic downturn, right. but people are always going to need roads and hospitals and exactly. cell phone Airports, towers. and towers. Yeah. Warehouses mm -hmm. will always be there and all that. So um, its ability to be a hedge against inflation, number one, because technically, right, um, well, we're looking very benign inflation environment right. in the Philippines right now. No? Uh, but it, assuming it does go up, actually, that would also be a repricing of the rental income, right? So mm -hmm. That pretty much would also be trickling down to the stockholders. Yeah, it's going to it's going to come back around, especially if it's a, you know, something like that that's getting a rental income. Correct. It's, you know, okay. Let's take another break, and we'll talk about some other things going on at the PSE with the Attorney Royal Ref Run. The Philippines has been around for centuries. Malayo na rin ang narating natin. But back then, the way of life has been mostly analog. Did you know that you need to take a boat from Cavite in order to go to Manila? Yes, ganon ang takbo ng buhay dati. You need to send a letter to the United States? Sure, pero aabutin ka ng isang buwan bago matanggap ang iyong liham. Kailangan mong tumawag sa bahay o sa iyong kaibigan? Many ways to do that. Pwede ka maghulog ng tatlong 25 sa payphone or use that vintage rotary phone na most likely, six digits lang ang landline number. Forget about email. Telex at fax machine ang modes of communication for business. You want to listen to that one song of your favorite band on repeat? Sorry, pero kailangan mong i-rewind ang cassette tape. Buong album naman ang kailangan mong bilhin, kahit iisang kanta lang ang gusto mo doon. But things change, and we as a race progress. The world is getting small. We are now a traveling population. Why? Because travel is now cheap. Our friends are across the world because our form of communication is now borderless. Time zones are now meant to serve as a guide and not as a limitation. We can buy things from the comfort of our homes. Nasanay na tayo sa convenience because why not? It is the price of development and the glimpse of our future. Have you imagined the future? How do you think it will look like? Driverless cars? Yes, autonomous driving will happen. Robots replacing low-value processes done by humans? Tama ka dyan. Paying for your groceries using digital currency? Very realistic. Materials being 3D printed instead of ordering? Yes, we are indeed a progressive race. And technology plays a vital and crucial part of it. How will this affect our lives? Kailangan ba natin itong matutunan? Mahirap ba itong aralin? Or kaya naman? How can our nation take advantage of these advancements? All of these can be understood and learned. Tayo ng matuto para umunlad. Nandito na ang Abante. Progress through technology. Okay, and I'm back with Attorney Royal Refran of the PSE, and we're talking about some new developments at our local stock market, and it's been kind of a, if you follow the business news, which you should, it's been kind of an exciting time for the PSE. Um, why don't you tell me about a couple of these uh, rule changes or implementations that you've had lately, because uh, that's going to potentially improve things for for investors uh, as I understand it you just implemented uh, a new dynamic trading price threshold and I think that went into effect this week didn't it oh, you may be referring to the uh, 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 the listing rules for well, purposes well of there's that. A, then there's that too the there's a uh, I understand there was also a draft, so it's yes. not implemented yet, but it's yes. a draft for discussion of new rules for yes. involuntary delisting, which yes. is unfortunately a thing that has to happen sometimes right. with some companies. Right. So in general, 
um, we're, we're right now finding, finding it most appropriate or most timely for us to reconsider, for example, trading rules, but first and foremost, our listing rules and all the way to the listing. Mm -hmm. right? That's the life cycle of any company and right. for investors, very material, right? We started with the listing because there were a couple of the listings, um, voluntary, uh, most of them, uh, I would easily come to uh, think of easily two, where there was a uh, debate on whether the price at which, uh, was normally in a delisting, voluntary delisting, uh, the company would offer to buy out the minority shareholders. What does right. that mean? They will offer you a price, give you a peer to make a decision, and normally if you really want to exit, meaning you want to already be uh, liquefying your investment, then you say, I'll, I'll sell to you. Um, if you still want to stay put, then it's your decision, even if the company will no longer be listed. That doesn't mean it's the end of the corporation. Mm -hmm. It's still a going concern, except right. that the facility for you to actually later on liquefy your investment would probably be not as easy as it is mm -hmm. because, you know, there's a lot of taxes, different environment and yeah. all that. So, so just, to, just to explain just to explain to people who know nothing about the stock market, delisting is something that a company can do if they decide they do not want to be listed on the stock exchange and have their stocks traded actively. So they can say, no, we don't want to be listed anymore. We don't, we're going to just hang on to our stock or we have our shareholders that we already have and they're going to hang on to the stock. And what they have to do is they have to, for anybody that wants to get out of that, and they, oh, well, no, I want your stock to be listed, and if you're going to take it away, I don't want it anymore. They have to settle on a price that they will buy out those investors who don't want to go along with them. And then sometimes there's, I, don't, I can't recall the last time I heard of it happening, but once in a while there is a, the situation where the, a company is actually removed from listing. Let's say involuntary. Yeah, listing. and that was the that was the new draft rules that I had heard. Yes. It, 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 it yes. just came we're, out that you're in the process of yes. finalizing. Yes, we're in, in the public comment period. For right. The second case that you mentioned, which is involuntary the mm -hmm. listing. The company did not make the decision to say, I want to go private. So right. normally a company would want to remain to be public, right? Mm -hmm. The reverse, which is going private, normally can be a function of the company making sure that it's still competitive, trade secrets are not out and not being telegraphed by competitors, they decide voluntarily to go private, to delist. Right. In the second case, a company may, may be doing well as a listed company, except that there are certain rules that may have breached. Mm -hmm. um, normally, the rules on public ownership. Right. We are requiring every company that, that is already listed to maintain a minimum level of public ownership. What does that mm -hmm. mean? You cannot be listed and still hold on to all the shares mm -hmm. and just right. give a token, token issue, a token percentage, which is below what is the minimum regulatory requirement. Right now it's at 10%, right. but yeah. if you go public, you should be at 20% the first time you go public. And then minim minimum flow through release 10. Some companies fall below that. Why? Well, there's a lot of corporate actions. There may be a private placement, which is inviting more strategic shareholders to the point that the, the, the public float or shareholders is diluted, right? There, there's a lot of actions right. which investors end up to be owning less than what they used to own. Because of that, you are now setting into play our involuntary delisting rules because we'll give you a period of six months to bring it back yeah, up. That was my next question is how long... You know, how long is your grace period? Because yes. I know there have been situations in the past yes. where there's been companies that have been way under the 10% yes. for a long period of time. Yes. And people start asking, hey, what's going on? Yes. You know, they should not, you know, they should not still be there at, yes. at that level. Yes. So, so what, what, what is changing about, about those, about those rules? So now it's all about the price, man, the price. Mm -hmm. And that's what you call the tender offer price. Right. A tender offer is, whether voluntary or involuntary, a company would probably requ request or request to offer, rather, to shareholders that they will buy you out. No? And it's always a question where the company will say, well, I was advised by my uh, financial advisor, a fairness opinion provider. Mm -hmm. And what it is, is it's really you get a third-party accounting firm or an advisory consulting firm, and they would do their... Analysis, evaluation of your cash flows, 
with the end in view of giving you a range, what's a fair price mm -hmm. for you to offer to buy out the minority? For the mm -hmm. longest time, we didn't have guidelines for that. As long as the fairness opinion was given by a company that is independent, meaning has no contractual relations, has, does not do your auditing and all that. No. But mm -hmm. that being said, it still had its perceived pitfalls because investors still thought, wait a minute, um, it's, it's what they call a contract of adhesion, right? In a contract of adhesion, it's take it or leave it. The same is true in case of a tender offer. Right. If you take it, then you sell. Uh, if you don't agree, um, but it will be delisted, you somehow feel so bad because if only they would increase the price, you would be more than happy to sell. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's where we came in. We thought we want to give them more confidence. We came up with a price range benchmark. There's nothing uh, that we just came out out of the blue. It's something that we benchmark across our peers. And normally they look at the volume and the price over a one year period, some even shorter, mm -hmm. to see where was really the average price for the past year before the listing. And that should be an indicative for the company so that you're not giving investors a shorter end of the stick. Right. You're giving so them instead a fair of, price. So instead of the you know, the investor just hearing a, a an opinion of the appraiser that the price should be this, the investor could independently, if they want to do the math, could go back and look oh, yeah. at the same records and say, okay, yes, oh, yeah. I can see that this is, right. you know, they may not like it, but they can see that this right. is what the it's price fair, should right. be right. And, and have a better decision. Right. And okay. compare that with the appraiser's mm -hmm. uh, price because we will now require companies and we're getting as much um, inputs from the stakeholders, com issuers, listed companies, the advisors, the lawyers, and all that. We'd like the company to pick whichever is higher of the fairness opinion price or that empirical one-year volume right. weighted average price. And whichever is higher of the two will now become the minimum for a company to set its final price. It could put a premium, give more to the investor, because some com companies still want to give goodwill, establish goodwill, and say, really, you know, um, you place your trust with us when we did our IPO a couple years years ago. Nobody wanted this to happen. This is an involuntary delisting, but we'll compensate you accordingly. Some companies provide a premium. But at least if you have that as a minimum, investors will now feel, I would say, more comfortable. And they're not going to feel as though they're losing. Right. Yeah. Right. You're, not, you're not getting the shorter end of the stick. Right. Right? Nobody wanted it. And, you know, we hope that we'll complete the comment period and uh, hopefully come up with consultations if needed and then present something that is benchmark. We're mm -hmm. not reinventing the wheel here. No? We want something um, that even the foreign and the local investors can compare with other markets because really capital markets you are not a standalone market, mm -hmm. right? Right. You have to be competitive because you are benchmark. Okay. All right. And um, one, one thing that I think that uh, not many people are aware of at all is that uh, PSE now has a cooperative arrangement with the Shenzhen Stock Exchange um, for some information sharing and right. things like that. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Right. So Shenzhen is a very dynamic stock market in China. Mm -hmm. There's also the Shanghai Stock right. Exchange. Shenzhen is where you see the more active stocks in the sense that these are the uh, fintech companies and all that. Mm -hmm. So they're very strong on technology. We have in, uh, an agreement, um, cooperative agreement with them to, for them to actually share with us their expertise on technology when it comes to disclosure, when it comes to us also through our subsidiary monitoring or conducting surveillance. Right? So that's the technology leg of this cooperation. This, this partnership with Shenzhen also allows us to share information on the market and see where we can create products that are going to probably be of interest to Chinese investors and to Filipino investors. I what see. am I saying? For example, in markets, we normally sell information. And that information we call market data. Mm -hmm. There are certain market data products that we can you know, co-design that could be very, very attractive for purposes of investors out of China that on, the, on the one hand, and might also be attractive if we are able to come up with products 
like an index fund or but what you have to first have that index that would capture the activity in the market and make that visible in the Philippines because really it's information mm -hmm. flow right we would that that's pretty much uh, I would say the first step the market data component you know, we'll, we'll we'll see uh, as an op as a on, um, from the get-go we could already start streaming in the market data from Shenzhen Stock that's Exchange. That's what I that's what I noticed. Website. Yeah, that's what I noticed first is right? that, you that's know, a, got their that's, ticker. So right? the, the low hanging yeah. fruit as I say. Mm -hmm. And then the technology component, something that provides me with a lot of opportunities to upgrade our systems. And and because of the partnership, uh, I think we're also seeing um, a lot of alignment with the uh, economic trust to also see what opportunities out of China can be um, cascaded to the Philippines, mm -hmm. right? So it's all, us also mirroring that uh, messaging uh, on the part of the exchange. So that's Shenzhen. Uh, hopefully, there would be more activities out of this partnership also. Oh, that's great. Well, I think we've about used up our time for this evening. I, we could go at this for a long time, so maybe we can have you back sometime. Um, Lots of interesting developments on the stock market, and whenever you see that there's a bad economic news, if you turn to the stock news, you'll probably find something to make you feel better because we are doing rather well. Um, and there are new developments already and some coming up, and you should pay attention to those. That's about all time we have for this evening. I'd like to thank my guest, Attorney Royal Refran from the PSE. I'm Ben Kritz, and this has been Eye on Business.